Thank you very much, uh, Katie. It's always nice when uh, your boss, and she's my boss now, says nice things about you, so I'm grateful. Uh, as well, I'm uh, so very deeply honored to be able to give the Leslie H. Bloomgart Historical Lecture, and I want to thank President-elect uh, Chuck there for the opportunity. And then as well, thank all the past presidents and the founders of this great organization, uh, which have built it into such an important entity. So uh, Leslie H. Bloomgart, I'll just say a few words about him, was an international surgeon and scientist. Uh, he was born in South Africa, got a bachelor's degree there, and then he went to uh, England to get his uh, CHB and MD. He moved to Wales, and then he got, I think, the finest professorship in the world because it's called the St. Mungo Professor of Surgery at Glasgow. Uh, he then moved to Hammersmith in uh, London and uh, subsequently was in Bern uh, for five years and then ended up in New York City at Memorial Sloan Kettering and at Cornell. So I think what speaks uh, most about this man is his true internationalism and how he crossed uh, borders around the world. What other person is so admired by French, Scottish, Irish, Austrian, Italian, and Swedish surgeons? Uh, he received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the European Society of Surgical Oncology, and he was a founder of the IHPBA. Your family history is the history of your ancestors. Your surgical history is the history of your surgical ancestors. So I would like to ask everyone in this audience who was trained by Dr. Blumgart or who was trained by someone who trained him to please stand up. <laughs> I think that says more uh, than the number of publications a man has written, the more books you have written, uh, what it says is how you pass down your surgical DNA is through the people you have trained. So uh, the title of this talk is A Pancreas Odyssey, and it's the story of chronic pancreatitis surgery in the 20th century. Truly history. The underlying journey that the Odyssey charts is a man's passage through life. How do you get there? What is the journey like? And how do you tell the story? So I'm going to try to tell the story of chronic pancreatitis surgery in the 20th century. Our president might call the trip that Odysseus took a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad business trip. And if you look at it, you see if he started at Troy, if he, he just crossed the Dardanelles in a boat, he could have walked to Ithaca in 10 days. Instead, he took the long way about, went to the land of the Lotus Eaters, past the Cyclops, headed up through the cannibals, the land of the dead, and then he started all over again, headed back, uh, went through Scylla and Charybdis, and then even passed time with Calypso once more. So the Odyssey story I'm going to tell you about pancreas surgery starts on May 22, 1902, when Teddy Roosevelt was president. Edward VII was king of England, but he had not yet had his coronation because, as you remember, it was delayed because he had appendicitis. And... Uh, required Frederick Treves to operate on him in the palace. I mention this just to give you an idea of what the state of surgery was at the turn of the century there. Surgery for appendicitis was something fairly daring in the palace. B.G.A. Moynihan begins the story with notes of a case on pancreatic calculus. Recent reviews describe that Moynihan removed a calculus from the pancreatic duct. The case was reported in the Lancet on August 9th under the title on pancreatic calculus with notes of a case by B.J.A. Moynihan, M.S., London, F.R.C.S., England, etc. So the patient was a married woman, age 57. She had her first attack on September 12th in 1901, an acute hysterical attack. The attack subsiding, careful research disclosed a multi multitude of symptoms, chiefly of a neurasthenic type. So again, you see how patients with chronic pancreatitis are stigmatized and marginalized by healthcare providers. And they're all said, well, it's all in your head. You don't have anything wrong. They finally decided to operate on her, and this is what uh, he wrote. He opened, exposed the duodenum. Uh, the papilla was laid open, cut edges were open. And at the bottom of the ampulla, a small object could be seen, and the knife touching it could be felt to be impinging upon soft stone. 
he got the stone out, and then he describes this stone. And the question I ask you, is this a case of a pancreatic calculus or a common bile duct stone? He describes the stone as in shape very closely resembling a French bean. It is exactly an inch in length and about 3 sixteenths of an inch in diameter. It is bile stained on the surface. Layers seem to consist chiefly of cholesterol and bile pigment with some calcium salts. Now I thought uh, a French bean was this, these big long beans up front, but in Great Britain, a French bean may refer to the kidney-shaped bean that sits inside of the French bean. So this is what he pulled out, and I think we can say that was not a case of pancreatic surgery. So let's move on and find another early pancreatic surgeon, the famous Professor von Michelitz, a pupil of Bill Roth. We know him for the Heineke Michelitz biloroplasty. He published in the Annals of Surgery in 1903 on 30 personal cases of pancreas operations. So that's about one case per page. Those were the days when you could dominate the annals with 30 patients. As far as I can tell, there are no chronic pancreatitis cases. This, this is his original memoirs, uh, Surgery of the Pancreas. Uh, he was in Germany at that time. He's really the most famous Polish surgeon of that time. What he wrote was that one can treat the subject of surgical interference for pancreatic calculi very briefly, as they are known to be very rare, and consequently no detailed accounts of the experience of surgeons with them are available. I find reports of two cases, both of which died following operation. In one, the stones were removed from the head of the pancreas and the duct of Worsung, and they both, to me, sound like probably cases of common duct stones. But Van Michelitz, I think, deserves credit for establishing the principles of modern surgical residency training. Eat when you can, sleep when you can, and don't operate on the pancreas. This is what he wrote in his original memoirs. A reason which has prevented the rapid development of pancreatic surgery is that the operation so far as it includes the organism itself, is much more dangerous than an operation upon any other abdominal organ. Two points come into consideration here. The pancreas is very rich in blood, and hemorrhage from an injury is difficult to control. Simple tying of the fragile tissues is insufficient, and one must stop the bleeding with sutures deeply buried in the tissues, including much of the latter, which has, no has the disadvantage of causing the parenchyma to necrose. This all sounds very familiar. In spite of deep sutures and heavy ligatures on mass, blood and pancreatic secretions ooze into the peritoneal cavity. Secondary hemorrhage into the peritoneal cavity is very apt to occur. A danger much greater than that from hemorrhage is due to the special secretion of the gland leaking from the injured parenchyma in larger or smaller quantities. So, from there to Indianapolis, and the hero of this story, I think, Goethe Link, who was assistant professor of gynecology at the Indiana University School of Medicine. In 1911, he published this case report in the Annals of Surgery, The Treatment of Chronic Pancreatitis by Pancreatostomy, a New Operation. I think I looked up different techniques and how to do a Whipple once, and I think there are about 3,000 uh, articles on a novel technique of a pancreatic digital anastomosis. So a new operation is not a new thing on the pancreas. So listen to this. This is what uh, Goethe did uh, in the middle of the day in Indianapolis without any attention to the wisdom of his previous uh, generations. I split the pancreas in the middle line along about two-thirds of its length, having protected the field with sponges. Opened the dilated duct of Wirsung, was found to be filled with small facetted stones along its entire length. The stones, excepting those in the head, were removed. A small portion was excised from the middle of the gland for microscopic study. Then he took a 16 French red rubber catheter, laid it in the duct, and closed the duct over the tissue. No effort was made to close the duct separately. No deep buried sutures were placed. In sewing the gland, care was exercised to have continuity of the outer surface accurate. Points of perfect coaptation were reinforced by single stitches. I can't tell you how many times I've been asked by patients when I explain a pusto procedure to them, why can't you just open up the duct and sew it shut? Well, maybe you can. So uh, he goes on and he says, well, in great measure, our timidity in dealing with the pancreas is due to erroneous deductions. In 1903, Van Michelitz, in an article which was generally accepted as the last word in surgery of the pancreas said, 
when we seek the cause of the tardy development of the surgery of the pancreas, we find we can ascribe it principally to the three general reasons that we must consider carefully. The reason Van Mikulic gave where it's hard to get to, it's difficult to diagnose, and what we all know, it bleeds, and when it leaks, it leaks. So in the pro-con debate of Goethe, Link versus the Baron, and that's not a picture of Goethe Link, that's a picture of Goethe Goethe, uh, I think I would give the nod to Goethe Link, and this is what he wrote. In our limited experience, the chronically inflamed pancreas can be cut, sewed, and worked upon as safely as can any other organ of the body as regards the organ itself. It is true that the topographic relations of the pancreas make it difficult to reach. Diagnosis is not easy. But in chronic pancreatitis, we have not found hemorrhage difficult to control. We have not found necrosis caused by sutures properly placed. We have not been troubled with oozing, secretions preventing peritoneal adhesions. We have seen no secondary hemorrhage, no fat necrosis. It may be urged that some change due to the disease condition has protected our patient from these operative accidents. This we think true to the extent that in chronic pancreatitis, there is a great production of connective tissue. So I just think it's remarkable that this Midwestern surgeon challenges the conventional wisdom of the great baron. Well, then there's an unexpected turn in the story. We go back to Great Britain and to Lord Moynihan at the Leeds Infirmary. And this is how it happens. It's recounted in a letter to the Annals of Surgery that Link wrote in August of 1953. And he began his letter to the editor saying that in March 1910, while doing an exploratory operation, the above condition was found and relieved by dislocating the pancreas, placing the tube in the duct of Worsung, et cetera, as I've already mentioned. So in March of 1921, Goethe Link received a letter from Sir Berkeley Moynihan asking for the latest report of your case of caudal pancreatostomy, saying he wished to mention the case in the new edition of his book on abdominal operations. Dear Sir Berkeley, I saw the patient about whom you have inquired three months ago. Her condition remains the same. She's occupied in a clerical position in the local post office. She still keeps her fistula open, wearing a small rubber tube which she moves and inserts herself. The drainage is collected in a rubber condom and leakage around the tube is negligible. There is no excoriation of the skin about the fistula, nor has there ever been any. At rare intervals, she has some colic similar to that described in the original report, but of lesser degree, never requiring medical relief. This is always due to cessation of drainage and is followed by relief occasioned by working out of small calculi in their discharge. The total amount of drainage is inconsiderable and less than it soon it was after the operation, and she has not had diabetes. Sincerely yours. And then uh, Link's patient died in December of 42, and she did get an autopsy, and Irvin uh, Abel, her physician, sent the report to Link at autopsy. What had been the tail and body of the pancreas had become practically a fibrous cord, all pancreatic tissue having disappeared except a small amount of the head of the pancreas. The pathologist who made the postmortem expressed surprise that the small amount of pancreatic tissue present had been sufficient for the needs of her body. Very sincerely yours. William Carlos Williams, one of the most important poets of the 20th century, wrote, not in ideas, but in things. And he said that in poetry, his goal was not to talk in vague categories, but to write particularly as a physician works upon a patient, upon the thing before him in the particular, to discover the universal. It's similar with the case report. When you have one patient, you have a chance in a case report to discover the universal, which is, I think, what Link did, and fits with the saying that came from Nicholas Sen, it's not the number of cases you do, but the number of cases you study. So the next island in our pancreatic odyssey will take us to uh, the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. And this is Walter Sistrunk, whom you know from the Sistrunk procedure, surgery for the thyroglossal duct cyst with excision of the hyoid bone. In the annals in 1921, Sistrunk had another case report of pancreatostomy. He found the pancreas slightly enlarged and quite hard, peculiar crepitating feel imparted to hand upon palpating pancreas, and a ridge could be felt on the anterior surface of the gland corresponding to the course of the duct. The pancreas was exposed, 
and many stones were removed through four incisions in the duct of Wirsung. Several stones in the duct near the ampulla were removed through an opening made through the duodenum. Openings in the duct were closed with small sutures. Again, who would have thought that you could do a ductotomy and close the duct and get away with it? The tale at the Mayo Clinic continued with O.T. Claggett, who did the first total pancreatectomy for fibrocalcific chronic pancreatitis. He was preceded at the Mayo with the total pancreatectomy by Priestley. But if you read the proceedings of the uh, uh, staff meetings of the Mayo Clinic, it records four cases of total pancreatectomy. And you can read uh, Claggett's case report. He says, a woman 37 years of age registered to the clinic on July 16, 1944. Her past history was irrelevant. I think this is a telling comment because most of the cases were presented by the Mayo internist staff, and they would go on and on and on about the past medical history. So when he got his turn, he just hit that epic button that said, past history is irrelevant. Uh, her illness had begun in 1937, had been diagnosed as acute pancreatitis. Uh, in the seven years since that illness, the patient had remissions and exacerbations. First, they lasted four months. Uh, eventually, he undertook surgery. And she did very well, but unfortunately, she died 10 weeks later at home. Uh, a severe insulin reaction developed, which was not recognized until after she had been unconscious for about 36 hours. She never recovered. It was unfortunate because she had been doing very well. She had gained weight, and in the patient's own words, she had been given a new lease on life with the relief of pain, which the operation had conferred. A great example of anecdotal medicine. Let me uh, just take a little break here and show you a picture of Charles Poix, a French endocrine surgeon who is a friend of John Van Heerden's, a larger-than-life figure. And this is how he scrubbed at the sink before an operation bare-chested with a pipe in his mouth. After he finished his scrub, his man Maurice would come and take the pipe out of his mouth and put his mask on, and then he would gown and do the case. After the case, Maurice would put the pipe back in his mouth after removing the mask, and he would go see the family to talk to them with his bloodied gloves and gown on, feeling that had, had a more dramatic impact upon the family and conveyed to them the severity of the operation. Well, the, the, the point is, uh, not Charles, but the scrub sink. And that's when, in olden times, uh, the attendings would sit with the residents and medical students and scrub their hands, and we would uh, talk about surgical history. Surgical profession is a heroic profession. Uh, that's why we love eponyms. Uh, we love larger-than-life figures. We want to be the superheroes that rescue our patients, and we honor uh, heroes of the past. And so all these eponyms, Whipple, Child, Duval, Pusto, Partington, Fried, Beggar, Burn, Isbicky, they've come into our vocabulary in this century. And I'll mention a few of them. A.O. Whipple, of course, is the grandfather of pancreatic surgeon in this country. And in 1946, he published uh, case reports of radical surgery for certain cases of pancreatic fibrosis associated with calcareous deposits. So he only took him 15 pages to describe five cases. He had three pancreatoduodenectomies, one total. And the most interesting case he described where he took out the head of the pancreas and most of the tail of the body, but he left a narrow strip of pancreas tissue over the SMV. This is, I think, an early example of a uh, uh, burn procedure, a fry procedure, a Zbicki procedure, how to avoid trouble when operating on the pancreas. He had five patients, uh, four were completely relieved of pain, he had one uh, post-op death. And the diagnosis was made, as you can see, by calcifications in the upper abdomen, which is the only imaging they had in this part of the world. Let's go to another clinic now on our uh, odyssey of the pancreas, the Leahy Clinic, and to Richard Cattell. So you may know Cattell if you've seen The Crown, uh, Anthony Eden there is shaking Churchill's hands. And the great failure of Eden's life was how he botched the Suez crisis. One of the reasons he botched it is he was having cholangitis at that time from a biliary stricture. He'd had surgery in Great Britain. And finally, he went to the lay clinic where Cattell repaired his stricture. 
At the American Surgical Association meeting in April of 1946, Cattell commented on the Whipple paper. And he said, well, we've had three patients, uh, and we haven't operated on them, and so you can sense where the drift is going. Uh, always in surgeons, there's those who are radical and those are conservative. And here Cattell is on the conservative side. Uh, and he mentioned that in patients with pancreatic cancer who had pain, they had done this pancreatogegenostomy by anastomosing the duct of Wurzung to defunctionalize the loop of jejunum. It's not difficult. Uh, it seemed to work. And it's quite possible that the same procedure could be utilized in calcareous disease of the pancreas, although it would have no effect on the diffuse calcifications. I suggest it as a possible means of relieving pain by a less radical procedure than total pancreatectomy. And you can imagine the sentiment in the room. It would be very similar to a discussion in this room about doing a robotic Whipple or a non-robotic Whipple. Uh, the debates go on. So let's uh, continue. Let's get out of the fancy clinics in Boston and Rochester and go to the heartland of chronic pancreatitis surgery, the VA system. Uh, there's the Bronx VA where Merlin Duval work, the Heinz Chicago VA, the home of Pusto, and then the Cleveland VA where Partington and Rochelle did their work. In the Annals of Surgery in 1954, Merlin Caudel, uh, Duval published two cases of caudal pancreatic ojejunostomy with two weeks of follow-up. Those were the days. Duval was an interesting man. He was born in Montclair, New Jersey. His father was a professional uh, hockey goalie for Toronto, became a stockbroker. His mother was a figure skater. He earned a bachelor's degree in music from Dartmouth, and then he turned to modeling to help pay his way through Cornell University Medical School. He's been on a shredded wheat box, and he even uh, has been on cigarette ads which again is uh, ironic. Uh, he did a, a rotating internship in uh, New York at the Roosevelt Hospital, did his residency at the Bronx VA, became a SUNY faculty, and he was the founding dean of the University of Arizona Medical School. In the Nixon administration, he took a leave of absence from uh, Arizona, and he became assistant secretary of health. He was instrumental in the National Cancer Act. He shut down the Tuskegee Project. There were many who wanted to keep that going, uh, because care was being offered, but he said, the name is, is uh, terrible, we, we have to stop this. Uh, he instituted the Emergency Medical Service Act, and he took the lead out of paint and gasoline. Uh, he is one of the few surgeons who've been a member of the Institute of Medicine and the National Academy of Magazines. So these were his two patients. One was a 46-year-old distillery worker, the other was a 37-year-old bartender, and we can only guess what the etiology of their chronic pancreatitis was. They both had calcifications in the upper abdomen. And you see on this uh, radiograph an intraoperative pancreatogram. And Duval uh, did the distal pancreatectomy and splenectomy in order to get the pancreatogram in many cases. He was an excellent gastrointestinal physiology, physiologist. His criteria for surgery was there had to be amylase lipase elevation during an attack, elevated fecal fat he measured diminished duodenal output of amylase and lipase and bicarbonate with secretin and uracolene stimulation. There had to be radiographic evidence of a dilated duct. No egress of dye into the duodenum with intraoperative contrast injection. And he made sure that secretin stimulation elevated intraductal pancreatic ductal pressure. Duval's conclusions were prescient, and then some not so much. He said, the presentation of an isolated surgical experience is not intended as proof of the thesis that chronic pancreatitis is a disease of primary obstruction to pancreatic outflow. It is entirely possible that the relief afforded these patients will be transient, as we know. He also said, to our knowledge, no similar procedure has heretofore been described. So that gets back to the question of surgical progress. How does it take place? Is it revolutionary or evolutionary? because you all know that many people are working on the same fronts, doing the same thing at the same time, and one person gets the credit with the eponym. So Duval got the eponym, but six months prior to his procedure, Zollinger and Ellison had published uh, a review paper in the New England Journal of Medicine, lead article entitled Pancreatitis. And those were the days when a lead article could be supplemented with a case report. So this is their case report. Uh, they first uh, opened the duodenum, did a sphincterotomy, drained a pseudocyst, 
cut off the tail, took out the spleen, pulled the stones out, sewed up the tail. When that didn't work, they just went back and did the caudal pancre pancre uh, pancreatostomy. So this is a very important principle of pancreatic surgery, which is the uh, Larry Bird principle. If you're hot, keep shooting. If you're cold, keep shooting till you get hot. So Zollinger and Ellison got it right. Next, uh, the picture comes from Boston when a child and Donovan were at Tufts, and they reported in New Orleans in 1956 the near uh, total pancreatectomy. They called it a subtotal duodenum preserving distal pancreatectomy. The patient was a 36 year old housewife. She'd had innumerable attacks. At operation, the entire body and tail of the gland was the site of chronic inflammatory process. Pancreatography readily demonstrated a complete block of the main duct. The head and unsate were relatively normal. Subtotal pancreatectomy distal to the block was performed. The patient has gained 60 pounds and has been well ever since. So again, one case report does not a series make. And it took Charlie Fry to go back and look up the results of the near total pancreatectomies of a child. He did it with William Fry, who's not to be confused with Charlie. William is a colorectal surgeon. So the results when in seen in follow-up weren't all that great. Uh, only about half of the patients uh, were alive and working well. And what Charlie Fry noted in particular was that alcoholics who had a subtotal pancreatectomy had about a 50% mortality rate. This is Nick Zaromsky in the Heinz VA with his friend Charles Pusteau. So in November of 1957 at the Western Surgical Association, Pusteau reported 21 patients and there were only two early failures. There were no operative mortalities. And here, what we think is the classic Pusteau procedure, distal pancreatectomy, splenectomy, and a foot in sock type of anastomosis dunking the pancreas into the jejunum was done. There were two late deaths. Two patients died later. The first died in a cheap rooming house and as far as we can determine was in an alcoholic stupor at the time of his death. The other patient died of an islet cell carcinoma in the pancreas approximately two years after the procedure. Again, warnings of the risk of association of cancer with chronic pancreatitis. Now, the uh, pisto technique is what should still be followed today, whether you're doing it laparoscopically or not. You send a specimen for pathology, you open the duct as far to the right as possible, you bring it through the transverse mesocolon, you don't necessarily do two layers, but you do uh, an anastomosis, and you drain it. What's also interesting about what Pusto reported is he included a longitudinal side-to-side -side method in the report, and he wrote that there was an alternate method of performing the same procedures to split the pancreas to the right, and then open the distal portion of the jejunum, jejunum for about six inches, so that one has, in a sense, a side-to-side -side anastomosis of the pancreas to the open jejunum, similar to the Partington and Rochelle technique. Now, uh, discussions were a lot juicier back then. You can tell from William J. Gillespie's discussion of the paper. He was the, the uh, closing uh, SAS. And he says, there seems to be an idea among some who have discussed chronic relapsing pancreatitis that if you don't agree with this concept, you are incapable of discussing the subject at all, and that they will defend their beliefs with fists if necessary. As far as we are concerned, we have presented this procedure it's a good procedure. It will endure. If it isn't, all the talk in the world won't make it any better. And then he said, <clears throat> well, it may be possible that I may appear like the village idiot Zeke who was found in the town square holding a piece of rope. And when someone asked him what was in his hand, he said, well, either I found a rope or lost a cow. I think Pusto and Gillespie had found uh, a cow. <coughs> so the next uh, breakthrough is uh, Partington and Rochelle, modified Pusteau procedure for retrograde drainage of the pancreatic duct. What you can see they did is, is they put the end of the jun junum to the tail and preserved the pancreas. They reported uh, seven patients. Uh, treated by this technique. They were all men, duct measured from 8 to 20. 
postoperatively, the most striking observation was the immediate relief of pain. There was recurrent pain in two. Uh, one was a, a continued alcohol user, and the other developed cancer. And then I'll take a little a sidebar here just to mention uh, Marion An C. Anderson, because uh, Charlie Fry always gave him great credit and said that he was one of the few academic surgeons who dealt with surgery for chronic pancreatitis. And he said at that time, academic surgeons who operated on chronic pancreatitis were just a slight bit above uh, a proctologist. So he was always grateful to Dr. Anderson's interest in uh, the pancreas, who founded the Pancreas Club in Chicago in 1966. The first meeting would at, was at his home. When he, he left, he passed down the uh, Pancreas Club to others. And he was someone who operated with me early in my career because the chief residents uh, didn't want to operate him. He was a classic Jekyll and Hyde kind of guy. Nicest guy outside of the operating room, the best residence friend, but in the operating room it was something like, uh, it's not an autopsy, he's not dead yet, uh, sometime today. And so I got the operator and he was decent with me. And I, I wondered how, where this nice man learned this technique. And his mentor was Loyal Davis, uh, Nancy Reagan's father-in-law, who Dr. Anderson and his wife referred to as LD, lethal dose who was trained by Harvey Cushing, who was known for going through three residents uh, at a time during a case. And what the resident said about him is that he did not speak ill of you, he spoke ill at you. And so I once asked uh, John Cameron if you think he learned that from Halstead, and Cameron said, no, no, Halstead was a, was a gentleman, he wasn't like that. So uh, Bill Schiller was, uh, the chief resident who was with Dr. Anderson, and they, they did some innovative work in chronic pancreatitis, acute pancreatitis, had uh, NIH funding to do research at that time, and uh, undertook amongst themselves to do a live surgical operation at the American College of Surgeons in the uh, 70s. It was a PUSTO operation. They were at uh, uh, Northwestern Hospital. It was piped into the big conference room, and as they were doing the ductotomy, going to the far right as possible, they cut through the gastroduodenal artery. And they were prepared for the eventuality of that in these cases. I mean, this was kind of like NASCAR. People were waiting, were waiting for the crash to see. But you didn't get to see the crash. They took you out of the room, uh, they shut it off, and they had a panel up there to chit-chat while the surgeons got things under control. And they cut out the video, but they didn't cut out the audio. So all the audience could hear was Anderson saying, Christ Schiller, suck. Christ, suck. So I always have a fondness for uh, Bill Schiller and Charlie Fry for saving the Pancreas Club and, and what they've done to move forward the field of surgery for chronic pancreatitis. This is uh, a meeting of the Pancreas Club in the late 90s with Bill Traverso and friends. You all know uh, Howard Reber and John Howard and uh, Hans Beger and John and Keith, and this is Bill Traverso, and I want to make reference to one of his uh, papers, which has always been a cautionary tale for me in terms of surgery for severe complications of chronic pancreatitis. Published in 93, sort of uh, close to this century, 28 patients, no mortality, 36% morbidity, but what always struck me was the 10-hour OR time. So he was a pretty good pancreas surgeon at that time, it was taking him 10 hours to do a, a Whipple. And that, I think, is part of the reason why Charlie Fry developed his procedure of local resection of the head of the pancreas with longitudinal pancre pancreatogegenostomy and reported the technique first in 1987 with Jeffrey Smith. Description and rationale of a new operation. And the rationale was to stay away from the portal vein and the SMV and resect the pancreas. It was also the principle that the weakness of the PUSTO procedure was failure to drain the head of the pancreas, and the remedy was to excise the pancreas overlying ducts of Wiersung and Santorina and the duct of the uncinate along with their tributaries. He made the point that if the head of the pancreas is five centimeters thick and the three centimeters from the duodenum, there's about six, inches of six centimeters of pancreatic duct that is not drained by a typical PUSTO procedure, but if you excavate the head, you can do that. So his uh, first report in 94 
50 patients, most of them alcoholic, as was the, as was the style, 84% uh, better. And then I, I think these are real numbers to me, the 34% pain-free and 17% minimal pain. Not everybody gets better. I've, I've never quite figured out how you can do a Fry procedure only removing 5.72 grams of tissue on the average. But this to me would be a typical Fry pancreas, a lot of ductal calcification, but a whole lot in the head. So it, this is just a, a table of some comparative uh, RCTs of pancreatic head resection with some uh, pancreatic duodenectomy, some Longmire procedures, some Baker procedures, some Fry procedures. And uh, what strikes me is the high success with pain relief. And I could never understand that since I, I couldn't ever do much better than 50%. But I asked myself, how is the United States different from Germany? And Tobias Keck answered that question when he compared a German experience to that which he had had in Boston. And if you look at the German experience, only about 31% of the patients had chronic pain as an indication. So they're not likely, uh, if you don't have pain before, you're not likely to have it after. And most of the indications were for plumbing problems. So surgery is great for plumbing problems. It's not great for neurologic problems, pain problems. In the US at the Boston, 62% had pain as an indication. And uh, I think many series are higher. But this is what Tobias described as a typical German pancreas. And this is a Boston pancreas. The point's well taken and has led to some other strategies of dealing with the inflammatory mass in the head of the pancreas, which hence Beger did when he published in 1980 his experience with duodenum sparing pancreas head resections and chronic pancreatitis. This precedes the Fry procedure. So he reported in 89, 128 patients with severe chronic pancreatitis and inflammatory enlargement of the head, 77% were pain-free and 67% returned to work, which is statistics I'll never duplicate in South Carolina since 67% of my patients never worked in the first place. <laughs> so I've I spent many uh, months uh, trying to find Dr. Byrne, and I finally found him here. It's uh, uh, Marcus Buchler, and modestly, he uh, named the procedure he developed after a town. And the burn modification of the Baker procedure is, in a sense, a modification of the Whipple technique of when you core out the head of the pancreas, leaving a rim of tissue over the portal vein. This was continued with Isbicki in 1998. The Isbicki procedure is uh, utilized for a non-dilated pancreatic duct, uh, again, may incorporate coring out of the head and is, is a, a desperate means to treat a desperate disease. He had good uh, outcomes, though, he reported. 13 patients, again, 92% complete relief of pain, 69% return to work. So that brings us back around full circle uh, through the Aegean, Adriatic, and Mediterranean, uh, back to the total pancreatectomy of Claggett. And uh, David Sutherland reported in his work at Minnesota, the first case in 1977. Others had tried. Uh, uh, John Cameron had done it. Uh, Traverse and Longmire had tried it. And they codified the advantages of the auto islet transplantation in combination with total pancreatectomy and that it required no immunosuppression, excellent island take, avoids long-term destruction, uh, avoids the perineural symptoms, good pain relief, kids do great. Uh, it does have problems, malabsorption, fissural hyperalgesia, and you're trading one chronic disease for another. So uh, what about the dual? Should we call it a Duval procedure or a Zollinger and Ellison procedure? a Pisto or a Partington-Rochelle procedure. Surgical progress is not necessarily revolutionary, but evolutionary, and it's not just surgeons. Uh, Leibniz and Newton did the same thing at the same time. And uh, in this cartoon, you see uh, Leibniz saying, they'll, uh, Newton saying, there'll never be another friggin' genius like me. I invented optics, mechanics, and the theory of gravity. You peeked at my manuscripts, don't try to lie. I'll drop apples on your calculus steel and ass from the sky. 
and Newton repair, uh, Leibniz repairs. If you didn't publish first, then you can't be pissed with my superior notation fluxations won't be missed. I'm glad you'll be a virgin when you die at last, so your inferior genes won't be ever passed. <laughs> so how is the history of pancreas surgery an odyssey? Uh, it seems, in fact, that maybe to take a 10-day trip, uh, we've taken 10 years. And if you look at the journey, we go from child, uh, Duval, Byrne, Fry, Beggar, Party to Rousseau, Pustel, Bicky, and is Ithaca the total pancreatectomy with islets? The first adjective used of Odysseus in the Odyssey is polytropos. The little meaning of this word is of many turns. He's the man who gets where he's going by meandering, indeed often by traveling in circles. In more than one of his adventures, he leaves a place, only come back to it, not always on purpose. For president-elect Chuck, I wanted to uh, give credit to his provost of the University of Pennsylvania, founder of the Free Library of Philadelphia. It's unfortunate to have much to say and yet to have no intelligible language in which to express it. This is somewhat the lot of the pancreas, which he said in, in uh, 1882. And Dr. Vollmer, being a Tar Heel, would recognize Michael Jordan's statement that the key to success is failure. Which brings up the Stuart Firestein book, Why Science is So Successful. It's because questions are more important than facts, answers or facts are temporary, data, hypotheses, models are provisional. Failure happens a lot. Patience is a requirement. There is no substitute for time. Occasionally you get lucky, hopefully you recognize it. Things don't happen in the linear or narrative way that you read about in papers or textbooks. The smooth arc of discovery is a myth. Science stumbles along. In conclusion, I'll use the words from the introduction of Samuel Johnson's preface to the 1755 Dictionary of the English Language. He said, I saw that one inquiry only gave occasion to another, that book referred to book, that the search was not always to find, and to find was not always to be informed, and that thus to pursue perfection was like the first inhabitants of Arcadia to chase the sun, which when they had reached the hill where he seemed to rest, was still beheld at the same distance from behind them. Again, I'm very grateful for the honor to give this lecture, and thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much.